Well, praise be to the God that surrounds us with love at all times. Welcome to Emmanuel United Church of Christ on this fourth Sunday of Epiphany. Welcome to those of you in person and online. You will see um, that we have fewer people in our sanctuary than usual uh, because many are holding back on Zoom while Omicron makes its way through uh, Louisville. And uh, we hope to be back into full gusto as soon as possible. For the time being, please know that online is certainly always an option. And if you need help with that, we're always willing to help. Couple of announcements. Um, Bible study will continue this Thursday at noon. Um, the only possible issue with that is that my son has had his daycare shut down again uh, because of a COVID case. And so um, I may or may not be present, but we have a student pastor who is ably ready to lead. Um, and he is also gonna help do some of the pastoral care visits this week, um, either by phone or in person or video visit. We're gonna work all that out. Um, and if you are in need of me for pastoral care uh, this, this week, I encourage you to reach out by phone. Um, if you don't have my phone number, you can ask uh, in the chat. I'm happy to do that or hand it to you here. Um, because it is, it is likely that I will be in and out more than usual um, because we are just trying to keep this little three-year-old alive until we can get some daycare again. Um, our folks are still in need of hand warmers and socks in our little pantry, so you can keep uh, bringing those in. Uh, it's been very, very helpful. People are very grateful uh, when they receive those. You can also still be bringing in pennies uh, we are still collecting pennies for the Miram pool. Uh, those pennies will be turned into dollars, which will be turned into the repairs that the pool needs for our camp this summer. Also, if you are someone who uses offering envelopes, if you're present here in the sanctuary, those are on the table in the middle back there. If you are online and would like some offering envelopes, uh, let us know we've got the box ready for you. You can either pick it up at the church or you can mark your calendars because next, is it next Sunday, the 6th, we are going to have a pick up Palooza again. Uh, and so you will have an opportunity to pick up all of those things that you might be missing as well as drive through communion, which we never thought we'd have to do again. But here we are. Uh, so if you would like to participate in drive through communion or uh, have anything else you need from the church, um, plan to come by 12 to 1, next, or I think it's 1230 to 1.30 next Sunday. Also, um, because we are still apart while together, uh, we would like to do a new sort of church um, photo. And so if you're watching online, we invite you to take a selfie of yourself and post it to our Facebook page or send it to uh, Samantha by email. Those of you here, you get to be in a selfie. Are you ready? Come down here. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna do wide angle here, y'all. Social distancing. Okay, ready? Everybody, I can't tell if you're smiling or not. One, two, three. All right. We'll add yours online. We'll make something out of it. We'll be creative. It'll be fun. Um, and also, uh, Samantha has some pictures of the folks who helped set up the apartment for the Afghan family that we have been waiting for and who is finally coming. Um, we should get to meet them this week. And uh, you can see here, there's Jennifer Fantoni and a mystery man in hat and mask there. Uh, you can see some images of setting up the apartment. Uh, we we're trying to make it as cozy as possible. Um, fresh food stocked. <clears throat> this is a very hands-on way that we are being the church this week and we are providing hospitality and welcome uh, to our friends who are coming to us from difficult situations. We want to try to make it as uh, pleasant as possible. So I thank you all for all of your donations and all of your um, 
just all of your prayers and efforts, I know it's going to mean everything to them. So thank you. And I will invite Joseph forward to do our call to worship. Friends, let us pray. God, whose love is vast and measureless, wider than the universe, unlimited and infinite, and in wonder, we worship you. God, whose love will never run dry, will never fall short, will never fail, and wonder, we worship you. God, whose love knows nothing of our distinctions, our notions of deserving and undeserving, which encompasses everyone. In wonder, we worship you, and in gratitude, we pray. Amen. Now, our opening music is a video from the Convergence Music Project of a song written by theologian Brian McLaurin and performed by the Awakening Soul Ensemble. So I hope that you enjoy it as much as I do. When demons eyes and may give his beak like angels If we have our knowledge and we know every mystery The demons doesn't make it, the faith moves mountains And if we give our money and we die like martyrs Hey, hey, whoa We have nothing if we don't have love And love is kind It does not envy or boast in pride Love is never rude or selfish It is not hot-tempered and it holds no grudges Nothing if we don't have love Hey, hey, whoa, whoa We have nothing if we don't have love Love does not delight in evil Love rejoices with the truth Believes and holds Love endures and lasts forever Hey, hey, whoa We have nothing and we don't have love Hey, hey, whoa We have nothing and we don't have Amen. My apologies, I thought it was a video, it was just a song, but it was a fantastic song. And, and hopefully there are, uh, there's a good earworm for you with the hey, hey, ho, ho. 
You may have gathered that this is the week we are talking about the very familiar love chapter from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. And uh, you, you will hear these refrains about what love is. And one of the things that's not particularly said here, but I think we can all probably agree on is that love is hard and love is, is challenging. Love requires us to dig deep, and sometimes we miss the mark. And so in this time of confession, uh, we're going to just offer those things and let them go. Let them go into the arms of God's mercy. So let us pray. Love is patient for our quick temperedness. Lord, have mercy. Love is kind for our indifference toward others. Christ have mercy. Love is not envious for our petty jealousies. Lord have mercy. Love is not boastful for our pretentiousness. Christ have mercy. Love is not arrogant for our opinionated views, Lord, have mercy. Love is not rude for our crass behavior, Christ have mercy. Love does not insist on getting its own way for our false sense of our own importance, Lord, have mercy. Love is not irritable for our resentful behavior, Christ have mercy. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. And for our rejoicing in all the wrong things, Lord have mercy. May God show us mercy, forgive our sins against love, and instead let love be what always remains within us. Amen. Friends, here is the good news. Even before we were born, God knew us. God has always been with us. Place your trust in God's presence and forgiving love and rejoice. For in the name of Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Amen. Please join me now as we together profess our Christian faith in the words of our statement of faith. We believe in God, the eternal spirit, who is made known to us in Jesus our brother, and to his deeds we testify. God calls the worlds into being, creates humankind in the divine image, and sets before us the ways of life and death. God seeks in holy love to save all people from aimlessness and sin. God judges all humanity and all nations by that will of righteousness declared through prophets and apostles. In Jesus Christ, the man of Nazareth, our crucified and risen Lord, God has come to us and shared our common lot, conquering sin and death and reconciling the whole creation to its creator. God bestows upon us the Holy Spirit creating and renewing the church of Jesus Christ, binding in covenant faithful people of all ages, tongues, and races. God calls us into the church to accept the cost and joy of discipleship, to be servants in the service of the whole human family, to proclaim the gospel to all the world and resist the powers of evil, to share in Christ's baptism and eat at his table, to join him in his passion and victory. God promises to all who trust in the gospel, forgiveness of sins and fullness of grace, courage in the struggle for justice and peace, the presence of the Holy Spirit in trial and rejoicing, and eternal life in that kingdom which has no end. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto God. Amen.
As we are still unable to sing in person together, we continue to have the gifts of beautiful instrumental music, and Pat is going to share with us the gift of love. Thank you, Pat. That was beautiful as usual. Today, our scripture reading comes from the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13, and I will be reading from the New International Version today. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging symbol. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have the faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I have nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always preserves. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, 
it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part when I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. The Apostle Paul wrote these words for the church members of Corinth, or did he write them for us? Amen. Hey kids, come on up front to your TV or tablet or laptop or whatever screen you're looking at for today. It's time for the children's time. And if you can tell, my background is kind of giving away what we're talking about. It's about all about love. But first, what's love? Let's think about things that we do love. We love our toys, our teddy bears and our Legos and our cars and our dolls and our all the things, right? And we love our electronics because they keep us connected like our tablets and our TVs and our computers and our phones and all that stuff, right? And we love playgrounds. Who doesn't love a playground? Or just playing outside, riding your bike, taking a hike, anything. And raise your hand if you don't like food ice cream, fruits, veggies, pizza, all the things. We love it, right? And then what about our friends? These pictures make my heart grow size, two sizes, just like the Grinches, because they make me so happy. And then what about these families? Not about you, but I love those families. So there's a lot of things that we love, right? But do we love them all the same? Do we love our Legos like we love our friends and our family? Or do we love ice cream like we, like, our, like we love our grandparents? I don't think so. So what is love? Well, we just heard a little bit about it and it's being patient, learning to wait sometimes. Love is kind. It's helping out one another when we can and taking care of others and creation. But what love isn't, is it's not rude, it's not jealous of what other people have, and it's not making fun of people. We know that, we're pretty smart. But what is love and where do we see it? Where do we find it? Well, I think we have some pretty great examples of some love in our life. We have friends and family, and we have all these people in our congregation that love people. We have a whole bunch of people who just really quickly this weekend got together and got in a whole apartment ready, a whole home ready for a family waiting for them to come because we love God's people. And I don't know about you, but we all have a little bit to learn, learn about love, even the adults, all of us, because every day we can learn something different about love and it can grow. Even in a Disney movie, you can learn about love. It's a new one. All the kids are probably already singing its song and so are their parents and their aunt, but it's, we don't talk about Bruno. Yeah, it's Encanto and it's amazing. It, I love seeing the way Maribel loves her family. She, even though she's not the special one or didn't get a gift, she loves those people with all of her heart. She tries to make sure that everyone knows how amazing they all are. And she helps them all the time. But the person that I think shows love probably the most in the entire movie is the one we don't talk about. It's Bruno. He loves that family. He loved them so much he left. Well, sort of left because he didn't want anyone to be mad at, Mar at Maribel because of what was going to happen or what he thought was going to happen because he had a vision that he wasn't so sure about what that was really going to mean in the future, but he knew how everybody was going to take it. 
So he left, but he didn't leave. He stayed in the house, but nobody knew. And he kept helping people. And when the house got cracks, he fixed them from the inside, but no one knew. And he even made his own dining room plate next to the rest of the dining room in the other inside the wall because he wanted to be a part of that family. But he knew that if he showed up, they'd all blame him. But he talked to Maribel and he ran out of the house and showed himself to his own mom just to say, don't be mad at her, it's not her fault. What isn't love? He was gonna take all of that because he didn't want them to be mad at her. I don't know what else shows love more than that. And every time I've watched it, which is a lot when I have Isabella right now because she loves this show and all the songs. And every time I see it, I think that's love. That's what love means. So if you haven't seen the movie this yet, go see it. It's worth it. Even the adults, you'll love it. It's got some earworms. I'll apologize now. You'll be singing all the songs all the time. It's fine. And if you already have seen it, maybe watch it again and see where you see love. Who do you see loving people for exactly who they are? And then so this week, it's our job to look for love and to see if we can love better. Let's see if we can be kinder, if we can be more patient, and if we can love people for exactly how God made them. Whether they think they're special or not, we know they are. And also to love yourself because you're special. No matter if you have some crazy gift to heal people with food or not, it doesn't matter you're God's child, you're still special. And that goes for the adults as well in the room. So let's pray because it's not always easy to love ourselves and to love all people, but we're gonna try harder this week. So please join me in prayer. God, thank you for loving us unconditionally and showing us what love means. For always wanting the best for us and forgiving us when we mess up and help us look for love to see it in our everyday lives, even in movies, and help us learn to be patient and kind and accepting, caring and encouraging of others. In your son's name we pray, amen. Please join me in prayer. God, help us to find new and innovative ways to love others. Amen. Short and sweet. I'm sure that many of you are quite familiar with this particular passage due to how often that it is read at weddings. In fact, because of its popularity at weddings, this might just be one of the most popular and recognizable passages in the New Testament, if not the entire Bible. So to state the obvious, this passage uh, has a theme of love, which you might have missed given that Paul only says the word love about eight times. And the reason for this repetitive usage of the word love is because this passage is what's called an encomium. Now, if you're like me and this is a new word, Uh, An encomium is a speech or writing that praises someone or something highly. And in this particular case, Paul's encomium centers on the virtue of love. In English, we only have one word for love, that being love. So when I say that I love my wife and I love my neighbor, I use the same word but the meaning is different based on the context. In Greek, however, there were different words for love to be used in different contexts. In this particular passage, Paul makes the literary choice to use the term agape to refer to love. And this is likely not the first time that you are hearing the term agape as it occurs 116 times over 106 verses in the Greek New Testament. 
However, this is where things start to get fascinating, as Paul's letter includes over half of its usages in the New Testament. In the first century Roman literary context in which Paul was writing, the most popular term to refer to love was eros. Eros was love that was intense, awakened, and driven by the desirability or value of something. Agape, on the other hand, was exceedingly rare to use and was a love that conferred value on something that would otherwise have been considered rather unlovable. So Paul's use of the term agape over the exceedingly more popular term eros was a deliberate choice by him to expand his audience's understanding of the depth of love as it is the essential condition of the faithful wife. So rather than a Hallmark style ode to sentimentalized ideas of love, this chapter offers what he thinks should be a foundational ethic for the church community. Love's quest never asks, what's in it for me? But instead asks, what is best for you? Love's nature is not to seek one's own needs but rather to seek the needs of others. And most importantly, love is a collection of the intentional actions, not a passive feeling towards another. In fact, the sweeping claims about love in verse seven, which says, it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things emphasizes the all-encompassing scope of love. And this means that the agape is the all-encompassing spirit in which all of the individual gifts that we have been given are based, as well as a guide for how they should be used. It is also this same active love for, which would other, for that which otherwise would be considered unlovable that Paul says that God has for us. Additionally, Paul even declares that the love characterized by the agape is eternal and will continue on whether will continue on when other finite things around us start to end. This is an idea that can be heard in Paul's letter to the Romans when he says, "For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Christ Jesus our Lord. Unlike Eros, which is a love felt toward something that we find desirable, the idea of the agape calls us to love something that we find unlovable or uncomfortable. And this could be a person, idea, or action, but is certainly not limited to those. The main thing is that the agape is not something that is easily achieved. While reflecting on the depth of loving others that Paul describes in the 13 short verses of this passage, I have wrestled with two primary things. The first is imagining what the agape looks like when it is being applied to the person or persons that I dislike the least in the, in the entire world. The people that are the most evil or that have done the most harm to the parts of God's creation that I care the most about? What does it look like to love the people I have such strong feelings about? If like me, you are also wrestling with ways to love the people that cause you and the parts of God's creation that you love the most, here are some ways that I propose. You could advocate for justice in the prison systems where inmates are often exposed to inhumane treatment. You could pray for these individuals 
that you have strong feelings about, that they do not have the experience, the same suffering that they have caused you or the ones that you love. You can advocate for the dismantling of societal systems that have given birth to and nurture hate and cruelty in the world. You can advocate for the advancement of policies that you know will in one way or another benefit the person or persons that you feel strongly about. Now, I would be lying to you if I said that what I have proposed above is easy. So to balance this, I will also propose some additional but less intense ways of loving individuals that you might otherwise not think very highly of. This could include not getting mad and losing your composure to a food service worker when it is taking a while to get your order. Not allowing or not, not allowing yourself to get too worked up when someone rudely gestures to you in heavy traffic when you definitely didn't cut them off and not rudely gesturing to the person that cuts you off in heavy traffic. All of the ways of loving what otherwise you might consider to be unlovable that I have proposed are only a handful of the infinitely many ways that the agape can look. The second thing that I have been wrestling with is how to use the different gifts that I have been given by God in a way that is centered in love. It is so easy to get so caught up in the excitement of finding one's gift or calling in the world that we forget to find ways of using our gifts to make the world a better place. For Paul, the greatest extent that we can live our lives and flourish as individuals is to live our lives loving others with the same love that God has for us. And this can be expressed by, but is certainly not limited to, using your love of books and reading by donating your time to a local library or hospital to read books to children using your innate handiness with tools to help build habitat for humanity houses or other forms of affordable houses for low-income individuals. Using your gift of writing to send letters to your public officials advocating for justice. And using your gift of speaking and being heard to lift up the voices and concerns of others who are not able to have their voices or concerns heard. And if you are at a stage in life where you feel as though you have no gifts to offer or you do not yet feel as though you have personally discovered your gifts, I ask you closely to listen to these words by the late theologian Howard Thurman. There is in every person something that waits and listens for the sound of the genuine in herself. There is something in you that waits and listens for the sound of the genuine in yourself. Nobody like you has ever been born and no one like you will ever be born again. You are the only one. And if you miss the sound of the genuine in you, you will be distraught for all of the rest of your life because you will never be able to get a scent of who you are. What Thurman is saying here is that whether you realize it or not, there is something deep within you that is special. It is something that makes you special and unique, and it is something that comes from God. The challenge is to reflect on your life and find out what it is that you have deep within you that makes you feel special. Whatever that thing might be, that thing is your gift and the sound of your genuine. And it is up to you to find out how God is calling you to use that gift to help make the world a place that expresses the agape 
a little bit more than before. Amen. Each of us in our own way make financial contributions to help maintain and grow the ministry of Emmanuel Church. Whether placed in the offering basket, sent through the mail, gifted online, we ask God's blessing upon these gifts. Let us pray. Loving God, we have been blessed with so much through your goodness. As we bring our gifts in gratitude this morning, you remind us that it doesn't matter what we have in our lives. If we do not have love, we have nothing. We long to experience agape love, the love of the world, the love for those we don't even know. Open our eyes and our hearts. In Christ, our teacher, we pray. Amen. Please stand for the doxology. You may be seated. Sisters and brothers, let us lift our hearts in faith to the one who hears all prayers and holds close all those in need. Holy God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence. Bring healing to all wounds, make whole all that is broken, speak truth to an illusion, and shed light in every darkness. We ask your strength and nourishment for the journey, especially upon those in our hearts who need your special care. Bill and Gail, Joe, May, Jennifer, Teresa, Vicki P, the families from Afghanistan, whom we will host in the coming months, all those who are homebound or in nursing and senior facilities, Jane, Mary Lou, Mary Ellen, Betty, Doris, people whose religion, race, gender, or other identities makes them live in heightened fear. Parents, teachers, students, and healthcare workers dealing with the brunt of the ongoing pandemic. People throughout the world experiencing disasters, oppression, and war. And all those whom the church may not know, but who very much need our prayers. All of these we hold in our hearts as we pray as Jesus taught us to our maker, our mother, and our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, go out into the world, shining the light of the agape to others in the way you need light from them. Go in peace. <laughs>